Okay, so I think it's time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your presence in this hybrid session in power electronics and communication systems at the 2021 CC conference. Uh, my name is Adrián Ramirez and I'll be the chair in this session. So today we have three presentations. The first one is model predictive current control of a permanent magnet synchronous machine with exponential cost function by Francisco Sainz and Omar Hernandez. Francisco, if you can share your presentation, uh, you will have around 15 minutes to present. And after that, we have a Q&A session up for about five minutes. Um, okay, so that's about it. Francisco, please go ahead and present. Yes, uh, do you can see my presentation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Francisco Gonzalez Sainz. Today I'm going to present the paper Model Predictive Current Control of a Permanent Magnet Synchronous Machine with Exponential Cost Function. Uh, the topics are the following. First, we talk about the control of the PMSM introduction. Then the model of the PMSM is presented. In the next section, we examine the fundamentals of the continuous control set model predictive control. And a design of current control is introduced. Uh, finally, we, uh, well, the simulation results and conclusion are presented. Uh, the Permanent Magnet Synchronous Machine, or PMSM, has gained wide acceptance in moving control and transportation application due to the characteristics like a high performance, high power density, low rotor inertia, and high efficiency and compact structure. Uh, to achieve an accurate performance of PMSM, high performance control techniques are necessary, such as a field-oriented control, or e FOC, this approach allows uh, performing a similar control of the one applet in the DC motors, the basic structure shown in the figure that incorporates conventional PI control leads. This results in a dynamic performance response limitations. Uh, this has motivated the development of different types of controllers to be applied in the PMSM, like a slide mode, a sliding mode control, dead bit control, fuzzy control, backstepping, and predictive control. This is the approach that we use in this paper. There are two different control strategies regarding MPC. One of them is the finite control set model predictive control, and the last one is continuous control set model predictive control. The characteristics of CCS MPC are the development are the uh, improvement of the total harmonic distortion. We have a fixed switching frequency, but with this approach, we have a high computational burden. An appropriate model is necessary because, or this is significant because the variable state prediction is based in the model. The voltage equation are given in equation one, where LSD and LSQ are the inductances, ISQ and ISD is the axis current, VPM are the magnet flux of the rotor, RS is the stator current in both axes, and omega M is the mechanical speed. The USD and USQ variables are the DQ uh, axis voltage. And as we can see in the equation two, the electromagnetic torque only depends of the Q axis current, that is a, a variable state. And we assume that the pair of poles that we can see with the letter P 
and the magnetic flu flux are assumed known. Uh, the decoupling is performed by defining the variables shown in tree. This, uh, well, the state space model can be write as equation four. Note that the new control variables are defined by UDD and UQQ, which are converted to PWM signals by the state space vector modulation technique and are supplied to the PMSM by a power converter. To reduce the error in steady state, an incremental state space model is used. The discrete state space model can be written as in equation five. For notation simplicity, the equation six refers directly to the model augmented of the system. Based on the state space model, we can do the prediction of the state variables and the output from the sampling instant Ki over a finite horizon prediction NB. Can be solved, uh, this prediction can be solved recursively as shown in the equation in seven by defining the vector capital Y and delta capital U. We can express the output prediction in a matrix form like in equation nine. It can be seen in equation 10 that if a large prediction horizon is used, the compute of the matrix F and the matrix if Ingress. Uh, for a given set point signal at sample time Ki, within a prediction horizon, the objective of the predictive control is to bring the predicted output as close as possible to the set point sig signal, becoming in an uh, optimization problem. The control trajectory is approximated by a Lager function, as we can see in. 11, which allows us to use a fewer parameters of capturing the control signal. Capital L and is the set of Lager function, and vector eta is composite for a set of coefficients. And capital N is the length of these boot sets. The Lager function can be constructed recursively, as in 12. For a MIMO system, each control input is associated to the respective set of Lager function and coefficient vector eta, respectively. The size of the matrix AL is the same size of the number of control of signals. Thus, the prediction of the future state variables become in 13, where eta p contains the coefficients to be minimized corresponding to each control signal. And B hat one to B hat M are the columns of the B matrix of the model augmented. And the control law is obtained by the minimization of the following uh, equation in 14. Subject to the constraints in the control signal shown in 15. In 16, we can see the modified Q and R matrix. With this change in the matrices, the use of large prediction horizon is ensured, and P infinite is the solution of the algebraic uh, Riccati equation. And the, Q, the matrix Q alpha are selected as semi-definite positive, and R alpha as, as a definite positive strictly. It can be seen in the exponential cost function shown in 14 in the previous slide that the state variables and the control input are associated with the respectively uh, exponential factor. Thus the original, the original system is transformed by the new variables in 18, which lead to the system in 19. Hence the uh, the matrices of the augmented model become in A hat and B hat. Well, the control is commonly performed in, in a cascade control approach where the outer loop is used to regulate the speed of the machine and the inner loop is used to regulate the DQ currents. In this section, 
the CCS MPC is presented. And it's assumed that the DQ currents are measurable and available for feedback. There are two necessary steps in predictive control, the output prediction and the derivation of control law. For the, for the current control of the PMSM, uh, the currents are selected as the state variables. Observe that the state are given by the augmented model. The control input are the DQ components voltage and the output prediction can be written as in equation in 20 and 21. In the case of reference tracking, the, the state variables are formulated including the reference as in 23. Thus, by using the, predict the predictive output and the Lager function of delta capital U, the cost function can be written as in 24. The R alpha and Q alpha matrices are used to balance the trade-off in the reference tracking and the control action. For R alpha, a large value of this matrix will tend to penalize the control action and leading to a slow response of the, of the reference tracking. To find the optimal coefficients of Lager function, the cost function J is minimized as a constraining optimization problem. And the solution of the equation 25 is given by the algorithm, the, by the algorithm, the Hildreth's algorithm, excuse me, that is used a programming algorithm. Um, this solution will lead to the optimal control trajectory of following the current reference. However, by the principle of the resetting horizon control, only the first elements of the optimal trajectory is applied to the PMSM. The parameters of the PMSM on their test are listed in the following table. Uh, for the simulation, a sampling time of system microsecond is used. The prediction horizon is set on 150. The control horizon is 10. The R matrix is 0 0.01. The set of lagger function is 15. And the exponential factor alpha is 1.2. The voltage limit are calculated to keep the reference voltage into the linear region of the space vector modulation. And the performance on the steady state evaluation with and without exponential cost function is shown in figures one and two. At the time instant of 0.7 seconds, a torque load disturbance is applied to the machine and is maintained for 0.7 seconds. The results show a fast dynamic response of uh, currents and accurate tracking of the reference speed. The similarity in the results with the transient state is due to both schemes minimize the original cost function but make some change in, in the weight matrices. As we can see in the image three and four, we have the same uh, response. Again, the new results shown the fast dynamic response in the currents and accurate speed reference tracking. But to evaluate the E effect to the computational burden on the long horizon prediction, the condition number and the AGEM values of the matrix used in the optimization are calculated. We can observe that the condition number for unweighted system is larger than the weighted system. Thus, we can say that the proposed approach is numerically well conditioned, avoiding the numerical instability of algorithms, therefore maintaining the stability of the closed loop system. And finally, the conclusion is the, that the application of the proposed methodology results in robust control of the PMSM under torque load disturbance. The exponential cost function is formulated to reduce a computational burden of long horizon prediction 
in the ETS MPC. This is verified by the calculation of the condition number and the obtained results demonstrate that the proposed methodology is an alternative to implement long horizon prediction in electrical drives. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you, Francisco. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Now it's time for questions. So if anyone from the audience has a question, you can raise your hand or you can write it in the chat. Uh, I can read it. Francisco, I, I have one question. It's, yes. it's more like a practical question. Mm -hmm. If I got it right, do you need velocity information for your control scheme? Uh, so in the presence of noise, what are the practical considerations that you need to take so that your control scheme works? Now uh, we can reduce the noise to come in into the system uh, by reducing the the sampling time. It's a manner that we can reduce the noise in the in a practical situation. Okay, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, Miguel Ramirez asks: Is it, is there a formula or a method? to obtain or choose the time of control prediction? And no, there is no a, a formula. Mm, only we um, keep the stability of the, um, of the, discretis, the discretization of the, of the matrix of the system. With the theorem, with the Nyquist theorem. Uh, Miguel Ramirez also asked, how can we choose the prediction time? Oh, the question is about the prediction horizon. Um, because I, I guess yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, no, this parameter is uh, arbitrary. And we can choose any any time of prediction, but this uh, scheme that we propose in this uh, paper is for a long prediction horizon. Okay, great. So we have time for one more question. Um, Francisco, do you have an implementation of, of your system now, or is that for the future? No, no, uh, not yet. The implementation was possible, but this uh, control, this proposed control, I implement in the future in my in my thesis topics. Okay. Well, so I think that's about it. Uh, thank you, Francisco, for your presentation. Now we have the second presentation. Then the name is DFT based phase or estimator using a NFA with a phase lead compensator by Rafael Escudero, Luis Ibarra, Pedro Ponce, and Arturo Molina. Um, Rafael, if you can share your presentation, um, okay. the microphone is yours. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, give me just a second and share the screen. Okay, just to verify, uh, you can see my, my screen, right? Yeah, right. Okay, perfect. So, one additional second, okay. And let's start, okay. 
Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Well, I, I quickly present myself again. Uh, my name is Rafael Escudero, and I am one of the authors of the article entitled uh, DFT-based phase estimator using a map with a phase lead compensator. Okay, so, well, let's proceed. Um, the electrical power system uh, is characterized by being a complex network vulnerable to faults, which can also lead to blackouts, and it suffers from the lack of fault diagnostics. This lack of fault diagnostics arose an interest in developing um, a monitoring system to improve the EPS protection. And the first idea to develop it was the use of the phaser measurement units, the PMUs, um, which um, mainly are uh, high-speed signal processors that estimate the phase angle and magnitude of an electric signal, such as voltage or current, and they provide their information as a time-stamped phaser with the help of a GPS. So the use of PMUs for the measurement system led to the concept of wide area synchro phaser measurement system. However, this last has some problems, mainly in economic terms, due to the high cost of PMUs and the need of wire communications, which also rise even more the installation and maintenance costs. Um, one low-cost alternative can be the development of wireless sensor networks, um, which have some advantages like rapid deployment, flexibility, and aggregated intelligence. Um, the main components of the wireless sensor networks are the smart sensors, which will be, in this case, the devices in charge of doing the phaser estimation process. And due to their limited processing capability, they require low computational loaded algorithms. Also, um, it must be borne in mind that the phaser estimator has to deal with frequency variations, magnitude and phase angle variations, harmonic contamination, and uh, complied with a set of requirements from the IEEE standard for synchrophasers. Then um, entering the state of the art, the how to say that typically the methods used for phaser estimation can be divided into two groups. The ones that are based on the discrete Fourier transform, like the cosine filter, the Fourier filter, and those that are not, like common filters, where they transform and phase lock loops. Uh, summarily, the DFT-based techniques have a low computational load and can deal with harmonics by themselves, while the non-DFT-based techniques require an adaptation, but with it, they can also deal with harmonics. Um, the drawback is that such adaptation implies a significant increment in their computational burden, and therefore um, it is unfeasible to implement them in a, in a device like a smart sensor. And due to the above, only the DFT-based techniques can be suitable for smart sensors. Um, as it was mentioned, the DFT-based techniques are the cosine filter and the Fourier filter, and both incorporate a moving average filter, the math, uh, which stands out for its low computational burden and its harmonics elimination. Um, and nevertheless, the problem with the math is that it causes a significant phase delay, which, by the way, becomes evident under step changes, as it can be deduced from its body diagram depicted in figure one. This delay translates into a slow transient response and it becomes undesirable in applications that require um, a fast response, like protection systems. Um, oh yeah, so then solving the maths phase delay problem will contribute to the development of a phaser estimation algorithm capable of dealing with harmonics, with low computational load, and with a faster transition response than that of an estimator with an uncompensated math. Um, uh -huh. Then in order to, to solve this phase delay problem, um, or this phase delay caused by the math, what is proposed is to add a phase lead compensator like the one developed by Goldstein, Guerrero, and Abusura in an article that they published named uh, Math PLL with Phase Lead Compensator. The advantage of this compensator is that the phase delay can be effectively compensated. Um, the math response is integrated in terms of harmonics rejection. And its implementation is also simple since it is similar to that of the math. The transfer function of this compensator is presented below. And in the body diagram of figure two, it is shown a comparison between the math and the phase lead compensated math, the, the CMAF. 
with an attenuation factor R of 0 0.95, just to show that the phase delay is compensated and the elimination of harmonics is, is not affected. Uh, of course, and in figure three is depicted the simplified block diagram representation of the proposed phase estimator. Uh, now entering the methodology first in figure four is presented the simplified block diagram of the three phase phase estimator in which the, the block named positive sequence computation calculates the positive sequence component of the three phase system. This uh, three phase version is required for the IEEE standard step changes tests and the case study, which will be explained later. Uh, on the other hand, in figure five is presented the developed block diagram of the proposed phase estimator. And in this diagram, um, sorry, diagram, the phase lead compensated moving average filter is shown in its weighted mean value approach. Uh, this is the WC math Fourier filter. The weighted mean value approach uh, serves to reduce the possible error arising from the value of the number of samples n, since this value does not always result by calculation in an integer number. Um, in figure six is presented the block diagram of the non-compensated math, also with its weighted mean value approach. And this filter's version was used for the traditional Fourier filter and the traditional uh, cosine filter. Now, concerning the test protocol, there are three aspects that are sought to be reviewed with this proposal. First, uh, tune the detonation factor of the phase lead compensator. Second, verified that the proposed phase estimator, that is the WCMath Fourier filter, can still deal with harmonics. And third, verified that the proposal can provide a faster response than a traditional Fourier filter. This is a, a Fourier filter with a non-compensated map. Um, it was used the IEEE C37.118.1 standard for synchrophasers to establish the tests to which the, the proposal was subjected as well as the metrics to be measured during its execution. Those metrics are mainly three, the, the delay time, which is um, the time between the instant that a step change is applied to the phase source amplitude or phase angle, and the instant where the step parameter reaches the 50% of the final steady state uh, value. Um, the second metric is the response time, which basically is the, the time the estimated phase source has a total vector error above 1%, before remaining below it. And the third metric is the total vector error, the TBE, which is a metric that aims to, to measure the difference between the estimated phasor and the theoretical phasor, which is given by the question that, well, is presented below. As it was mentioned um, before, the, the proposal was compared with the traditional Fourier filter and the cosine filter, setting uh, 60 Hertz as the cutoff frequency for all of them. Since most of the cited authors in the greeting document um, had used 10 kilohertz as the sampling frequency in their simulations, the same value was used uh, by convention. Finally, uh, the presented models and the tests were done through simulations with the help of the software Simulink. And well, in the harmonics tests, um, the IEEE standard mentions that the input signal should be contaminated with each harmonic individually up to the fifth whose amplitude must be 1% of the fundamental signal's amplitude. And the total vector error, the TB, shall be measured when the steady state is reached and it must never be greater than 1%. This information is summarized in table one. Uh, the amplitude and phase angle step changes must be done following the indications of table two. Um, the delay time, the response time, overshoots and undershoots shall be measured and they must not exceed the values presented also in table two. Uh, for the attenuation factor tuning, it was used the step changes test, the, the one that was presented uh, uh, before, and the objective was to determine which value of the attenuation factor, or R, meets the IEEE requirements related to the response time and the overshoots. As a case study, it was used the IEEE 13 node test feeder to simulate an electrical fault in order to compare the responses of the proposed phase estimator and the traditional free filter and the traditional cosine filter. The one line diagram of this test feeder is depicted in figure seven. Um, specifically, a line to ground fault of phase A was simulated at the beginning of um, the line 692. And well, 
This test is intended to compare the responses of the state filters in a situation where, um, for example, their interest could be to, to detect electrical fault as soon as possible. Well, uh, concerning the results, first for the attenuation factor tuning, uh, three different values of the attenuation factor were used, being 0 0.95, 0 0.97, and 0 0.99. The results are presented in table three. Uh, values that do not comply with the standard are indicated in red, and those that do comply with blue. It can be seen that the closer the attenuation factor is to unity, the delay time becomes uh, shorter, and that the, the proposal did met with the standards response time requirement. However, uh, none of the three values met a 5% overshoot. And then an iterative process was done in which the attenuation factor R uh, was reduced by 0 0.1 until this requirement was met. At the end of this process, an attenuation factor equal to 0 0.89 was reached, and in table four, R are shown its results. Harmonics tests, uh, only the free filter and the proposed phaser estimator, the WCMath free filter, met the IEEE standard, and the free filter was the one that showed the lowest TBE values. In table five is presented a summary of this test where the minimum, the maximum, and the average total vector error are reported. It can be seen that the percentage difference between the total vector error of the WCMath Fourier filter and the traditional Fourier filter is about 0.013%, which is insignificant and therefore implies that the MAPS harmonics elimination was preserved. Uh, the results of the amplitude and phase angle step changes are shown in tables six and seven, uh, where the best results are in blue. The WCMath Fourier filter results with uh, an attenuation factor of 0 0.99 were included uh, for the sake of comparison. It can be seen that uh, the WCMath Fourier filter uh, showed the shortest delay times. Compared to the traditional Fourier filter, the 0 0.89 version presents an, an average reduction in delay time of 8.72% and an average reduction in response time of 5.31%. On the other hand, uh, although the overshoots and undershoots of the WCMath Fourier filter with an attenuation factor of 0 0.99 were above the limit specified by the standard, um, it stood out for having the lowest delay times in all the tests. Uh, concerning the case study, in figures 8 and 9 are depicted the estimated current and voltage phasors, respectively. Um, with these two graphs, it is actually seen that the responses of the proposed phaser estimator with um, an attenuation factor of 0 0.89 uh, is, well, it's quite similar to that of the traditional Fourier filter. Uh, or in other words, it can be seen that the improvement of the version with 0 0.89 is insignificant. Uh, on the other hand, the improvement in the transient response with the attenuation factor equal to 0 0.99 is significant but its overshoots and undershoots also increased. Um, what else? Well, in addition, it can be noticed that the cosine filter fails in estimating the phase angle. And this is mostly due to the fixed discrete delay that is, um, how to say it, that is inherently related with its mathematical model. Um, and well, uh, finally, from, from this research, uh, it is concluded that the proposed phaser estimator exhibited a faster transition response while preserving its ability to eliminate harmonics. Also, it was observed that the attenuation factor must be lower than 0 0.9 to meet the 5% overshoots, undershoots requirements by the, by the IEEE standard for synchrophasers. And that reducing the attenuation factor R also reduces the overshoots and response times. But um, this, this reduction in the attenuation factor also increases the delay time. Um, although the proposed phaser estimator, uh, the WCMath Fourier filter with R equal to 0 0.89, met the IEEE standard and showed a faster transition response than the traditional Fourier filter and the traditional cosine filter, it did not significantly reduce the delay time with respect uh, to the Fourier filter, for instance. On the other hand, uh, the WCMath Fourier filter with an attenuation factor of 0 0.99 
did significantly uh, reduce the delay time, but this version did not meet the, the IEEE standard for synchrophasers. Then, um, as a phaser estimator, this proposal seems not to show uh, significant advantages. Um, perhaps, or um, however, if this estimator was intended to be used for protection systems applications, um, such as fault detection, it will be convenient to use it with an attenuation factor of 0 0.99. This is the, the, the fastest version of this phaser estimator. Um, the drawback of this version, as it was mentioned, is that the overshoots and undershoots increased significantly. So this decision will be up to the systems designer. And finally, uh, for future work, it will be worthwhile to, to pay special attention to how to decrease the, the overshoots and undershoots of the proposed phaser estimator with high values of the attenuation factor. And well, I, I think this this is mainly the, the end of the presentation. Um, briefly, I, I show the references that were used in the written document, and I think they will, this will be all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. So it's time for questions. If there are questions from the audience, please raise your hand or you can write it in the chat. Uh, so w one quick question, mm -hmm. Rafael. Mm -hmm. how do you choose that factor R? Uh, I think that it's mm -hmm. based on the numerical exercise, but is there like a like a formal process to, to uh, formal process? Value? Yeah, I I think um, I I reviewed the the um, literature. Um, I think that's that's the correct expression, and I couldn't find uh, a more formal uh, procedure to to do this attenuation factor tuning. Um, the way in which I reached an attenuation factor of zero point eighty nine was mainly in, in this iterative process in which um, if I saw, well, through simulations that the overshoots uh, requirement was not met, then I decreased this attenuation factor uh, by 0 0.1, right? So uh, I started with, as, as it is mentioned here, with 0 0.99 and 0 0.97 and 0 0.95. Um, with 0 0.95, I realized that this, this IEEE requirement was still not met. So from here, I started to decrease the, the attenuation factor. So then I met another, I did another simulation with 0 0.94, 0 0.93, and so on, until this, this requirement of the standard was reached. And this was reached precisely with this value, 0 0.89. So this is how I concluded that the attenuation factor uh, should be at least below 0 0.9 in order to, to comply with the IEEE standard. However, um, um, I, I understand that perhaps this, this iterative process might be not, not so mathematically formal. I, I guess that's the, that's the correct expression, but that was the, the only alternative that I could thought because uh, it was difficult to find uh, in the literature or um, uh, a more formal process to, to do this attenuation factor tuning. Okay, great. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's see if there are questions from the audience. Well, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Giselle. Yes, I, I have a question, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, have you considered to use uh, artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence. Ah. Okay. Uh, oh, that's an interesting uh, point of view. No, I I didn't uh, consider to use artificial intelligence. Um, I, I am aware that perhaps well, this the, the artificial intelligence is perhaps not my expertise field, but but I'm aware that for for example, the um, genetic algorithms can be a, a good tool when the the tuning of compensators or uh, or controllers uh, becomes quite uh, quite complex, right? So yeah, perhaps uh, uh, with uh, considering perhaps more digits in the attenuation factor tuning, because well, uh, instead of using two, I could use three or more. Uh, I think uh, perhaps uh, through a genetic genetic algorithm, uh, 
or any other um, artificial intelligence uh, technique, this, this attenuation factor tuning could be done. But, but yeah, in, in this research, I, I didn't uh, I didn't thought about it. But yeah, I, I think it could be a, a very good tool to, to use it in, in this part. Yes. Thank you, Rafael. Well, I have just a quick, All right, thank quick, you. quick <laughs> yeah, thank you. recommendation uh, before we go to the to the final session. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that delay makes the response slower, but there are papers mm -hmm. that show the opposite, that delay is, is beneficial. As you can see that mm -hmm. maybe in your table, if you go to the bottom on the left, the delay time uh -huh. is smaller than the one in your table on the on the right. So in some uh -huh. sense, increasing the delay improves the response of your system, uh, regardless of the of the R value. So it, it's just like okay. an observation for you to consider. Well, oh, okay. Th thank you, Rafael, for mm -hmm. your presentation. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Thank you. Sure. And now we have our final presentation. The name is 5G connectivity for aerial scenarios, a new spatial and temporal perspective for wireless network uh, by Giselle Galvan and Jorge Aguilar Torrentera. Uh, Giselle, please go, go ahead with your presentation. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to share my my screen. Wait a second. Okay. Have you seen it? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. The last session of this technical day is a uh, 5G connectivity for aerial scenarios and you special temporary perspective for wireless networks. That work has been done uh, since that. And uh, Dr. Jorge Aguilar Torrentera from the University Autonomous of Nuevo León. The contents of the presentation is divided by the introduction, 5G service categories, incorporation of UAVs to wireless networks, attitude, latency, communication channels, and finally, the conclusion and future, future considerations. As introduction, uh, we know now that today, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, or commonly known as drones, needs a widely deployed communication infrastructure. In this context, it's said that the fifth generation 5G of mobile networks is a communication technology well matched for the drones industry. Alternatively, UAVs can provide a fast and easy option to the traditional terrestrial mobile networks to deploy in infrastructure of access. Uh, first of all, we can see uh, an illustrative application of UAVs, for example, for monitoring a crop field. is a classical example of the use of the UF UAVs infrastructure. On the other hand, we know that a, a traditional cellular communication infrastructure can attend a set of mobile users. This is a, what traditionally we have uh, been known uh, during these uh, uh, several years around the world. Thus, it's clear that the USBs and terrestrial mobile networks can operate with mutual benefits as is depicted in this picture. As can be seen, USB's infrastructure uh, can provide a dynamic deployment of aerial base station to complement the coverage of the network. On the other hand, UAVs can find an already deployed broadband communication infrastructure through which their information can be sent. Then we have uh, basically the three categories for, that form the essence of 5G. First of all, the enhanced mobile broadband to achieve both extreme high peak data rate and extreme wide, uh, wide area coverage. Then the massive machine type communications to support 
a massive number of devices, mainly oriented to Internet of Things. And then ultra reliable low latency communications to simultaneous support low latency and very high reliability transmissions. From these three points, three uh, categories, it's important to highlight that the ultra reliable low latency communication is an important requirement for a safe operation of multiple aerial autonomous vehicles using a common space. Now, how is the incorporation of UAVs to wireless networks? The, the use of uh, UAVs has been considered recently to be integrated to, mobiles, to mobile 5G communication, which is easier to deploy in a dynamic manner. In other words, where and when it is necessary and can increase the performance of a heterogeneous network in terms of its coverage and the data rate. These devices can work in two modalities from which use cases can be considered. On the one hand, as part of the network infrastructure in such a way that they operate as on the fly base stations or aerial base stations. On the other hand, these vehicles can be another mobile device or aerial user equipment. User equipment is a term that is used in the from the for generation of mobile communications. So, in the first case on the on the fly base station, this option usually provides good propagation condition because it is more probably that the terrestrial users find paths without obstruction, in other words, in line of sight. Thus, this 5G range is extended in a vertical scope wider than that of traditional terrestrial base stations. Remember that typical configuration of terrestrial base station antennas are down tall tilt as is depicted in this figure. Please note that this peculiar feature could introduce no connectivity conditions to some aerial devices. Hence, considerations on the antenna radiation pattern and position of UAVs in a three-dimensional three space become essential via factors to take into account. Uh, now here we have uh, another example of uh, on the fly base stations as a part of the incorporation of these devices to wireless networks. Uh, in this case, uh, a swarm of drones are operating as on the fly base station, which can require to provide jointly a particular service for a dense quantity of users. An example as can we see in this in this uh, figure, is a, a song that this is monitored with a high density of the devices and where an event occurs, for example, a car crash. And the information is sent from one drone to another uh, around it. Now, uh, the other modality that we have introduced the um, drones to the wireless networks as we have said, is as aerial user equipment. In this modality, the UAVs operate as uh, user equipment and therefore they access to the mobile infrastructure to send and receive information through terrestrial base stations. The information carried by this aerial user equipment naturally varies depending on the type of application for which they are used. Those different resources can be required for each drone. Uh, in both cases, uh, the incorporation of, of these uh, devices to wireless networks uh, and, and its uh, dynamic uh, introduce space and temporal variations on the coverage. For example, drones working on, on the fly base station can easily move towards the, those positions where devices require more resources, for example, at its cell edge. Then the network coverage is temporally modified. Uh, coverage of aerial base station can be affected also by random perturbation introduced by the airflow or body vibration of drones coming from 
uh, pitch, roll, and yaw angles of the of the drones. On finally, 5G capabilities will provide algorithms for trajectory of aerial user equipment, making an efficient planning and connectivity management. Therefore, the use of the UAVs in any modality stimulates having an ad adaptive coverage. Uh, now let's talk about the altitude as a parameter that in, uh, modifies some perspective for the wireless networks. So the height of which UAVs fly is one of their main characteristics. Both high and low altitudes UAVs have been considered to be connected to current mobile networks, but particularly the performance for low altitude UAVs is still under research in terms of interference and mobility for deployment in 5G. In any case, depending on the UAV's height, natural or artificial obstruction will play an important role. Also, shadowing and multipath fading phenomena, commented later, will be affected by the UAV's altitude. From this three-dimensional perspective, it's straightforward to consider a combination of drones flying at different altitudes as it's depicted in this figure. Moreover, the jointly capabilities of the UAVs can be extended using high altitude platform and space satellite infrastructure as can be seen in this figure. This architecture can exploit the strengths of each signal, spatial, aerial or terrestrial, to the required service and where each is more efficient. Then, note that depending on the altitude, different performances are achieved to the end-to-end -end link, subject to constraint on size, weight, and power of the UAV. In other words, this condition will limit the UAV's operational height. <laughs> In the altitude terms, there are different applications of low altitude uh, UAVs supported on mobile infrastructure so, such as uh, search and rescue, emergency case, early warning, and so on. That implies that drones have to fly in difficult access zones or in certain moments that the communication infrastructure has been damaged. In the example of this figure, the UAV's height allows to avoid obstructions and therefore, therefore provides more possibilities to reach directly or through a relay UAV the nearest 5G in infrastructure. It's important to highlight how the deployment of the UAVs under these extraordinary circumstances introduce a temporal behavior to a mobile cellular network. That's it. The system has to adapt to the new aerial infrastructure incorporated to the world mobile network in an unexpected moment. That implies that the UAV 5G system must have a fast and robust algorithm to schedule resources, make handoff, etc. Uh, now let's talk about the latency. That is a very important parameter, as we uh, mentioned in the early slices. See, and it's well known the latency refers to the total contribution of the latency involved in end-to-end -end transmission. In other words, in a is a the the, the round trip time. Uh, as an alternative to reduce this latency, some authors have proposed to implement UAVs as computer and relay nodes when these devices operate on the fly base stations. Basically, the idea is to adopt the well known 5G uh, mobile edge computing MEC, component to the UAVs capabilities in such a way that the some computer services of the US, uh, UE, sorry, are processed in a local manner instead of using uh, network core resources. The latency is highly related to the propagation channel. There can be different propagation conditions due to the diverse scenarios where aerial devices are deployed. Those it is important to study the characteristics that define the channel in order to derive theoretical models that provide tools to evaluate and predict the behaviors of latency in different environments where 
these devices are integrated to the, these new 5G mobile networks. In terms of the communication channels, as we can um, summarize it through the presentation, we can uh, divide the, uh, the in two perspectives. For in one the, on the one hand, in the spatial variations, uh, it is not uncommon that several researchers present measurement results where line of sight conditions dominate in the propagation channels. Also, channel parameters in a air to ground scenario are sensitive to the USB height. Shadowing is not only attributed to large obstruction in the propagation paths, but also it is considered the fuselage wings or even the engine of the UAVs. Now, in terms of the temporal variations, the communication channels have to consider that drones operate both as on the fly or aerial user equipment, and they can be uh, flying in hover mode but also occasionally can be uh, flying in or can be in movement. On the other hand, different Doppler shifts are generated depending on the relative moment of aerial and terrestrial stations. This difference in time can be exploited in difference in benefits of tracking and localization techniques. This situation can be particularly useful for application where swarms of drones are deployed. So finally, as conclusion and future consideration, we would like to highlight that, uh, as we can see, different aspects involved in the integration of aerial devices, specifically uh, unmanned aerial UAV uh, into 5G has been addressed through this paper. Uh, the UAV dynamics open a new perspective in a spatial and temporal base which is particularly important for the channel modeling and in general for the UAV 5G operation. The incorporation of computer communication capabilities, for example, MEC, to aerial user equipment will permit reducing the latency. The expansion of drones in the deployment of future mobile networks will imply new challenges of aerial vehicles and their interaction with terrestrial communication infrastructures and other aerial de devices and satellite platforms. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Gisa. So we have time for one question, maybe from the audience. If there are any questions, please go ahead. Uh, Okay, so I think there are no questions. So with this talk, we finalize this hybrid session. Um, I just want to thank the speakers and the audience for, for your assistance. And I hope to see you soon in another edition of this conference. Uh, that's it. Take care and thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.